Welcome back, sixth graders. We are ready for chapter two of Blood on the River. Chapter two. On Saturday, the 20th of December, in the year 1606, the fleet fell from London. Master George Percy, observation gathered out of a discourse of the plantation of the Southern colony of Virginia. Remember sixth graders, this is our epigraph. It's a short quote from a primary source, an actual document from 1606. This is Master George Percy. And these are some of the ships that we'll be learning about. Some would say I am lucky. Others would say I am doomed. I escaped the gallows, and that is why I am lucky. The magistrate mumbled something about having a son my age, pulling me, pulled me out of my dark jail cell just after two days, and marched me down to the orphanage. His name Samuel Collier, age eleven, dead of son of dead peasants. Can you take him? He asked Reverend Hunt when he opened the orphanage door. The Reverend nodded to the magistrate and showed me to my bed in a row of neatly made beds. Reverend Hunt is a tall, quiet man with broad shoulders and more patience than anyone I have ever known. He tells me I have a lot to learn about right and wrong. It was wrong to steal the locket, he says. It was no longer yours. It belonged to the pawn shop owner. He says I need to make decisions based on love, not anger. And I loved my mom and I wanted her locket back. So I was acting out of love. He just shakes his head. The locket would not have brought your mother back, he says. I know he is right, and I know the real reason I stole it is that I was angry at the bosses at the poorhouse, angry at our landlord, angry at the world. But how can I make decisions on love when there's no one left to love? The orphanage was not a bad place, better than sleeping on the streets. Maybe if I'd been less of a danger to the other boys, they'd have let me stay. But the boys started calling me thief and jail rat, and I knew only one way to settle the argument with my fists. Colin's nose spurting bright red blood was quite an accomplishment. But I think Richard's tooth only fell out because it was already loose when I punched him. As for being doomed, if I am doomed, then so is Richard. We are the two boys Reverend Hunt decided to bring with him on this journey to the new world. Richard is to be the Reverend's servant, and I am to serve a man called Captain John Smith. It is early on a December morning as we walk from the orphanage to the docks. Fog hangs thick and cold. It makes the stone houses drip and the waddling and daub houses look soggy. Richard carries Reverend Hunt's satchel, heavy with his books and Bible, and some extra clothes. My new shoes clump on the cobblestones. The shoes are too big, passed on from an older boy who died at the orphanage last month. But Reverend Hunt says I can't go barefoot in the new world. The new world. The boys, Collins and the others, think we will die there. They even begged Reverend Hunt not to go. The Reverend explained to them that the explained to them the importance of the mission. King James has granted a charter to the Virginia Company of London to send men to the New World, to Virginia. The men will explore for gold, silver, and jewels, and for a new passage to the Orient. And they'll cut down New World trees to send back to England to build English houses, all to make a big profit for the investors of the Virginia Company. But the real importance, Reverend Hunt says, is to bring the good news of Christ to the native people who live in Virginia. He says we'll go look for survivors from the Roanoke colony, the settlers who went to Virginia with Sir Walter Riley over 20 years ago. That is why Reverend Hunt wants to go. But I want to go for the gold. They say it washes up on shore with every tide. 
We reach the harbor. The sky is gray with the morning light, and the place is alive with commotion. Hawkers are calling out their wares, and I smell fresh baked bread. Sailors put on ropes and pulleys, lifting barrels to swing from each shipyard's arm so they can be loaded on board. Officers shout orders, and sailors march up the gangways, carrying loads on their shoulders. Reverend Hunt points out three ships that will be ours. Their hulls and scaffolding are newly painted in rich blue, deep maroon, and pale yellow. He says the largest one is the Susan Constant. The next in size is the Godspeed. And the smallest, a uh, a pinnace, is the Discovery. They bob next to the docks, and I watch as crates of chickens are carried on board. I scan the throng of men milling around the docks. There are hordes of gentlemen dressed in velvet and silk, sailors in their wide leg slops, and one very dirty boy selling eels. I wonder where he is, this Captain John Smith. Reverend Hunt says he's a soldier, and he says he is a soldier, an officer, not a ship's captain, but a captain in the English military. And he is a commoner, a yeoman. So I don't look for him among the gentlemen. I am to be Captain Smith's page, which means I'm supposed to serve him and learn from him. I don't argue with Reverend Hunt, but inside I scoff at the idea. Me, an apprentice to an officer? I've never been teachable in my life, except my mom teaching me how to read. That I sat still for, but my father tried to teach me smithing. And when I ruined a piece of iron, out came his fist. I won't have some man I hardly know trying to beat sense into me. A man comes marching up, his face flush red with anger. A sword hangs by his side, and his cape flies as he walks. They're sending nothing but gentlemen, he shouts at Reverend Hunt. By God, who will build the houses? Who will grow the crops? Do they think they can eat the gold and silver they are hoping to find? He spits on the ground. I know these gentlemen. They'll expect to have everything done for them. Expect it to be easy. They won't lift a finger to work. Reverend Hunt speaks calmly, lays a hand on the man's shoulder. John, there are carpenters going too, and laborers. And these boys and more gentlemen than commoners, the man shouts. The investors of the Virginia company were raving mad when they chose the men for this journey. And then suddenly he seems to notice me and Richard. Is this the boy you promised me? Which one is the fighter? Reverend Hunt nods my way. The man who I think must be Captain John Smith narrows his eyes at me. I narrow my eyes back at him. I have a moment to study him while he studies me. Not tall, but stocky and strong. Curly reddish-brown hair and beard. Flashing green eyes. If you beat me, I'll spit in your ale, I threaten silently. Captain Smith smiles slightly, almost as if he has had heard my unspoken threat. Yes, he says slowly. We'll take that energy you've got for fight and put it to some good use. He turns to Reverend Hunt. At least we'll have a good worker here. Is that what he plans for me? To make me into a workhorse? I cross my arms over my chest and scowl. Captain Smith looks about at the crowd. Where's Captain Newport? He asked impatiently. I want to speak with him about this gentleman problem. He marches off, leaving us behind. Reverend Hunt turns to me and Richard. There are men here whom you must show extra respect to. You understand? Richard and I both nod. I've never seen so many finely dressed gentlemen in one place. Over there, Reverend Hunt points discreetly with his chin. Sir Edward Maria Wingfield, a very high-ranking gentleman, and a member of the Virginia Company. Remember who he is. I take a good look at Edward Maria Wingfield. He's got a puffed out chest and a strut like a peacock. Wingfield, I say to myself, imagining him with bright tail feathers and wings. I won't forget. And there, Reverend Hunt says, 
Captain Bartholomew Gosnold, Captain of the Godspeed. I already have birds on my mind, so I think of a gosling with light colored brown down to match Captain Gosnall's fair hair. And him, Reverend Hunt says, that's Captain John Radcliffe, captain of the Discovery, the smallest ship. Captain Radcliffe has close set eyes, close set and beady eyes, a long pointy nose, Ratcliffe, I whisper, and have to bite my lip to keep from snickering. snickering. And over there is Captain Christopher Newport. He's captain of the Susan Constant and leader of the whole expedition. Do not forget who he is. I see Captain Smith talking to a tall, dark-haired man in a red doublet. The man's right sleeve is pinned up and empty. I remember the boys at the orphanage talking about Captain Newport, how he was in a battle at sea with the Spanish and got his arm shot off. I would think that the loss of an arm would diminish a man, but I see that it has not diminished Captain Newport one bit. He nods to Captain Smith, then looks over the scene around him with an air of confidence and authority, as if it were his kingdom. In fact, these three ships and all of the men on board are his kingdom, until he drops us calling us safely in the new world. Now wait here, Reverend Hunt tells us, I'm going to find out which ship we'll be on. Richard and I stand there, but we don't talk. Richard is younger than I am by a year, and a bit shorter and broader, with dark, serious eyes. We haven't said a word to each other since I knocked out his tooth. This suits me just fine. I don't need a friend. I haven't needed anyone since my mom died. Reverend Hunts returns and tells us we will be passengers on the flagship, Susan Constant. A breeze picks up. It will be a good day for sailing. Get your men on board, Captain Newport orders. I feel a leap of excitement inside me. Doomed or not, the adventure is about to begin. All right, the end of chapter two. Now, let's see what we have noticed. <laughs>